This is Miles TV. Welcome to Smile Television Talk Show, the best community affairs show in the Midwest. We have a great broadcast for you. Remember Dr. Dez? <laughs> What's on your mind with Dr. Dez? Well, she is going to do a whole show today. Yay. But first, like I told her, she has to start off with me. <laughs> We're going to be talking about anxiety disorder. You don't want to miss this broadcast. Remember, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He was crucified and buried, and he rose on the third day. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and thou shalt be saved. Stay tuned for more smiles. Did you know that almost 18.1% of adults struggle with anxiety disorder? Dr. Desiree Holmes, our resident psychologist is going to break some things down for us and, and sit back and listen. Go get a notebook and pen because she may give you some very, very relevant information that you want to um, just keep. Dr. Dez, welcome back. Hey! How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am blessed. Thank you. As you see, we have Dr. Dez on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor's on the couch today. Thank you again. And, and you know, I didn't share with our audience that you have some guests coming in at I the um, second half of the show. You know, um, one of the goals that God had given me along um, the way in study of television production was to assist others in producing their shows. And today, Dr. Dez is doing her own broadcast. We're going to start off and talk about anxiety disorder. But she has some guests, some very great guests, some, some psychiatrists who will come in and, and, and she'll talk with them and she'll put them on the couch. <laughs> Let's talk about anxiety disorder. Yes, ma'am. So, first of all, um, you know, I, I said I wasn't going to ask this first, but I, I think we need to. Mm -hmm. What is anxiety disorder? So, let's start with what it's not. Okay. So, anxiety disorder, it's a combination of um, where people engage in excessive future threat. Mm. So, they're, they're, they're excessively thinking, overthinking, um, about a future threat that has not occurred yet. Mm -hmm. And that's a little slightly different than a fear because a fear is a natural emotional response to a situation, to where a person may be in a dangerous situation, um, where the fight or flight response, so that's a very natural thing. You know, if, if you're, um, a tiger is approaching you, you feel a sense of fear, that's natural. Anxiety is something that's a little different. Anxiety is where it's this disproportionate, um, excessive thought and engaging in this um, belief almost that something is about to happen and it hasn't, it hasn't even occurred. Even right, it hasn't even occurred. And so it's very future oriented. Mm. It's, it's very future oriented. And so just keeping it very, very plain. And so that's where people get into this um, avoidance of a thing or this excessive worry over a thing. And when a person is engaging in it and they're having difficulty controlling that and they're not able to stop it, that's where then it can go from this just very normal response to something that's becoming a bit more abnormal. Because we all have some type of anxiety to a certain level. Right. But I guess um, on a regular basis, we're able to, to control it right. more. So when it becomes a disorder, Right. And it's over the top. So considering um, that there are 18.1 adults in our country. 18, 18%. And so it's 18%. So, so let me give you then a number what that translates please, into, that please. percentage. Because if you say 18%, that may not sound like a whole lot to people. But mm. what that actually translates into is... 40 million wow. adults between the ages of 18 and say 54, 55 mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. 40 million people. And depending on where you get your information from, that statistic from, it can be as much as 30% because you're not including people who are um, may have it and don't know that they have anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. You're not including people that uh, may be dis 
misdiagnosed and have you know being diagnosed diagnosed with something else, mm -hmm. or you're not also including the people um, that are seeing a doctor for something else. So when you say um, forty million. So, in looking at dollars that the country may have to spend for hospitalization, treatment, I guess that really can um, rack up in the numbers. So, some statistics, mm -hmm. and it's a little dated, so it's probably even higher, but, but there are statistics that will say as much as $142 billion. My goodness. In, in, in health care costs, in terms of just looking at um, from a standpoint of anxiety alone. What that says is that's the cost of, like you said, hospitalization. Mm -hmm. It's the cost of medications. It's the cost of, and what we're not even tapping into is what it costs for loss of sick days. So there's an economic cost to it because people miss out on work. Well, that's a good point, and we need to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk about anxiety in the workplace and the impact that it might have. Don't go away. We're talking about anxiety disorder. I want you to listen to this little clip that we're going to show from um, IDEX Media Pro, the, the company that produces Smiles Television. Don't go away. Stay tuned for more Smiles. IDEX Media does a lot. From IDEX Photography to IDEX Films. We help create forever memories and forever impressions. Image a nation. Image a world. IDEX Media. Awesome sauce. Yeah, baby. Welcome back. We're with Dr. Dez. What's on your mind with Dr. Dez? You just saw a clip, however, with IDEX Media. They're the ones who keep this broadcast going. I, I just thank them so very much. Also, before we get back into the uh, conversation with Dr. Dez, we have a brief little announcement. East St. Louis School District 189, and particularly East Side High School, has agreed to assist Smiles TV in the production. And which is going to be great because the students will get an opportunity to learn the whole production process from design to implementation. And we call them Students in Training with Smiles. So stay tuned for that. That's coming up. And it's, it's going to be through the East Side Works program um, sponsored by um, East St. Louis School District 189. Dr. Dez. Yes, ma'am. Okay, when we, when we left and went to break, we were talking about the workplace. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the impact of anxiety in the workplace. So, you know, the impact in the workplace, as I was saying, can be tremendous because when we're talking about loss of days at work, we're talking about the frequency and the duration for how long a person could be out from work because due, due to anxiety. And, and let me just say this. Anxiety cuts across, so it's not any particular segment of the population, though women tend to be more so than men tend to get a diagnosis of anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, but it can cut across all economic mm -hmm. you know, uh, stratospheres, so it doesn't hit one particular racial group or ethnic group than others. It can cut across any and all. So let me just say that so that people can, can take that. Because one of the things that we like to do here on What's On Your Mind with Dr. Des, we're always trying to educate and take the stigma and, and the mystery away from what's going on. So let me just say that anxiety can occur with anyone mm. at any age, including children. So with that being said, uh, what are the various types of anxiety? So there, there are several different types, but due to time, I won't go into all of the different types, but I think the, the major ones, generalized anxiety disorder is, um, is, is, is one of the major ones. Um, and that's where you get into, again, a lot of excessive anxiety, a lot of excessive um, worry. And when we speak with uh, Dr. Loin and Dr. Loin, we're going to get into a little bit more of that in terms of treatment um, and how do you treat those anxiety disorders. We also have separation mm -hmm. um, disorder, and, and that's usually associated, and it can be with adults, but typically you find that that's associated with children 
And so what it is with, with separation anxiety is that they fear the loss of their loved one, the attachment. Mm -hmm. And so they spend mm -hmm. the better part of their day or their time worrying that something is going to happen to their loved well, one. Well, you know what I can remember growing up when um, my mom and dad may have had to go out to work or whatever, and my older brother was, was taking care of us. Mm -hmm. I can remember sitting at the window waiting to see yeah. that they were coming back. Now, yeah. I don't know if it was a disorder, but I can tell you I had some anxiety. <laughs> well, well, so, so, and, and again, again, we, we want to keep in mind that from a developmental standpoint mm -hmm. as a child, that's normal. Okay. So that's not like Thank there's God. some abnormal thing to it. What makes it, again, moving into that where one could classify, is this within a normal range? Is this outside of a normal range? Mm -hmm. It really is the length of time that a person is uh, persisting in that type of behavior. Mm. So when they're getting an assessment or they're getting an evaluation, that's one of the things that either the therapist, the psychologist, or the psychiatrist, they're going to want to know that because that's key information. How long has that behavior been going on? So again, let me just say that if your child, it's very natural when children start kindergarten or even daycare, you know, they have that separation anxiety. That's a normal, normal thing, mm -hmm. okay? But if your child, let's say, is now a freshman in high school and is still having difficulty with that, now you, you know, that's outside of what's appropriate. Well, okay, and um, as you mentioned, your guests are going to be Dr. Loin and Dr. Loin. Yes. It's a husband and wife team, and um, what's on your mind with Dr. Des will continue, and we're gonna, um, put them on the couch. And as a matter of fact, Dr. Dez will be the host. And this is um, the sort of a spinoff to her own broadcast. She's not gone yet. We're not letting her go yet. No. <laughs> but um, we would like to see Dr. Dez do her own show besides, aside from uh, Smiles, which would still be a Smiles production. Um, thank you again. And thank um, you. looking forward to listening to um, the next segment. Thank and you. And don't go away. You're gonna be here with What's On Your Mind with Dr. Dez. So hello everyone. Today on What's On Your Mind with Dr. Des, I have some very special guests. I'm so excited. Today we have with us, we have two incredible psychiatrists. So we have Dr. Chris Loind and his beautiful wife, Dr. Kaleche Loind. And so let's get a little background information on um, you in terms of what your practice is because both of you kind of have some some specialties of your own and just a little bit about what brought you into the field of psychiatry Ladies first. Well, thank you so much for having us um, Dr. Daz. It's a pleasure being here and um, For my part, I went into the field of psychiatry um, unbeknownst to me um, I didn't really understand what it all encompassed until I did the rotation in medical school. And then at that point I thought, that's what I want to do. I knew I wanted to work with children and adolescents. And so um, picking a field that um, focuses on not just a physical um, part of the body, but basically the whole person, you know, taking into account the whole being, your mind, your spiritual body connection, um, I think that's what psychiatry really is all about and that's what was one of the things that attracted me to that field, uh, which I'm ever so happy that I picked. Good, good. And you, Dr. Lloyd? It would be pretty much the same. Um, when I was in medical school, I really enjoyed just working with people more than body organs or parts. Mm -hmm. um, and believe it or not, actually before medical school, I spent a year in the seminary, believe it or not. And so I, I've always been interested in the whole person, mm -hmm. the, the spiritual side of people, the philosophical side of mm -hmm. people, the biological side of people, mm -hmm. um, the cultural side of people. And I feel like in psychiatry, that was the one specialty you can really focus on the whole person mm -hmm. and, um, and counsel them and try mm -hmm. to get them um, better as far as quality of life. Now, they're also very global people, so they're globe trotters. And Dr. Chris Loin also, you speak Spanish. So yes. you're also fluent in Spanish as yes. well. And so I want to get into, so our show today, we're talking about anxiety disorders. And one of the emphasis that we do here on What's On Your Mind with Dr. Des is really try to take the stigma away from mental health and educate and inform people. And so that's really the biggest emphasis. And so I want to take 
the stigma away from anxiety disorder and I want to talk about specifically focus on treatment if a person um, thinks that perhaps maybe they have an anxiety disorder what is the first thing that you do when they come to your office so um, <clears throat> It's a good question. Where do we start in terms of treating people? So now we've identified that there's a concern. Their families usually typically are the ones that are pioneering that. Sometimes it's the school referring the patients. Um, but whatever avenue they come to us through, um, one of the first things that um, I would do in my clinic is to do a thorough assessment. So we usually at times could use structural clinical interviews, we could use a clinical interview based on the diagnostic statistical manual for psychiatry in order to determine whether this is a pathology. Is this a normal reaction to a stress? Is this a normal um, developmentally appropriate fear? Um, or is this something that actually like you um, alluded to earlier affects function you know so if a person isn't able to then do what they're supposed to do at whatever developmental age that they are then that could become a problem once they're in my office the assessment is done sometimes I need collaborative information mm -hmm. I might need screening tools to be completed um, and some objective way of measuring um, the anxiety in order to then assess my treatment outcome as I treat them and they get better. So there are several um, different um, screening tools and you know, structured um, interview pieces that we can use to identify who really is um, pathologic with anxiety. Once that's done, um, the information is shared with the family and treatment options can then be discussed or initiated. Now, you treat children and adolescents and young adults, and Dr. Chris Loin, you typically treat um, adults and, and more mature to senior adults. Is there any difference between how you approach treatment between the children and adults? Hmm. Since I only s treat uh, adults, I, I wouldn't be able to comment necessarily on the difference between children and adults. Um, just to comment though too, I think the uh, first thing you always want to make sure is that there's no medical issues. And so obviously with adults, uh, there can be complicated medical right. issues, there can be complicated substance abuse issues, right. and you want to rule out anything other than psychiatric issues, mental health issues, right. first and foremost to make sure that um, you're, you're treating um, appropriately. Um, so with adults, you have to be a little bit more careful okay. assessing all of the medical issues because obviously with younger individuals, they tend to be more healthy. Yeah. And I'm glad that you touched on the substance abuse part of it because um, anxiety disorders is definitely one of those disorders where people want to self-medicate. So you get a lot of alcoholism going on, you get a lot of people smoking marijuana that's going on. And so again, when you're having to prescribe something, how do you take all of that into, in, into account with that? So I think, first of all, as um, Dr. Christopher Lloyd pointed out, ruling out organic etiologies, um, ruling out substance abuse. Once you find that there is something there, you may have to go down that path. So someone who presents to the ER saying that they're having palpitations, we have to make sure that it really isn't a cardiac origin, like they're not having a heart attack. And so we want to make sure that the EKGs and medical you know, um, workup is done. And once that's done, we can then focus our energy on treating, if there are substance abuse issues there, then we will need to start process in that you know, in that department in terms of treatment, you know, rehab and, you know, detox and things like that that might be required for that person. Um, but yeah, once that's done, then, you know, we can talk about the treatments for anxiety at that point, which include, um, so you mentioned how do, we discern, how do we discern when we're treating for children versus adults, what's the difference? You know, so children's anxiety processes might be different. I mean, okay. the, we have generalized anxiety disorder can happen in both adult and, and pediatric populations, but we have certain, we can have separation anxiety that happens only in a school age. We can have school avoidant, you know, uh, anxieties in children and adolescents. And so depending on which one it is, the approach might be different. Um, but for children and adolescents, the biggest thing is the, you know, encompassing the family mm -hmm. because sometimes parents have you know psychopathology some parents have anxiety mm -hmm. you may need to look at the mother and child you know, the parent child interactions and mm -hmm. attachments and those types of things determine uh, where to direct your treatment treatment for anxiety disorders first and foremost as I said earlier you want to make sure there's no medical issues going on 
Um, the second thing would be to make sure a lot of times there's comorbid dual diagnosis substance abuse. You want to try to get people sober if there's any concerns mm -hmm. for addiction mm -hmm. or abuse of any substances mm -hmm. in order to fully treat them appropriately. The most common treatment for any anxiety disorders would typically mm -hmm. be what we call an SSRI from a medication standpoint. Obviously, the research has proven, though, that the combination of good therapy mm -hmm. and medications is actually what's proven to be best as far as helping people get better, mm -hmm. quickest, and maintain um, good mental health for the long run. Um, going back to uh, medications, mm -hmm. the standard of care would be initially an SSRI or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Those types of medications essentially help people relax more, help calm um, them better. It also, coincidentally, they work with uh, people who have depression as an antidepressant. Um, other types of treatment could be focusing on specific symptoms. A lot of people okay. with anxiety will have problems sleeping, and so a, a mild hypnotic can be used to help people sleep better. Um, the one thing you typically want to try to avoid are other addictive type of medications. Right. So the most common one that are used for anxiety disorders mm -hmm. that are also quite addictive are what's called benzodiazepines. So medications like Xanax and Valiums, Ativans, Clonopins, you really want to try to avoid those as much as possible because you don't want to turn an anxiety disorder into an <laughs> addictive disorder. Right. Um, so if you are prescribed those, you have to use them very cautiously and as needed, not as a daily thing. That's a wonderful point because you, you, we, like we said, we already mentioned about substance abuse. And so to, do you have other medications that you can prescribe that in the place of some, some of those SSRIs that you just mentioned, are there some other medications that you can use in place of that then? And yeah, they are. They, the answer is that they are. So they are MAOIs at, at times that, you know, so imipramine in children can help with certain types of anxiety. There are um, other classes of medications that are not your typical SSRI or SNRI that we can use. Um, but really, we're trying to focus on symptoms and using what's safest. You know, some medications have side effects that we have to be mindful of. So depending on what it is, we may choose to or not use that because of that very reason. So the answer is that there's a host of psychopharmacology that we can use. You know, there's still a lot of research that needs to um, go into understanding um, anxiety and how to further treat it. We need to consider um, neuroscience. We need to link neuroscience and bio, you know, biogenetics. We need to link behavioral science as well as, you know, psychotherapies that, you know, we've already alluded to cognitive behavioral therapy being the champion in terms of mm -hmm. what's helpful for anxiety mm -hmm. and depression. Um, so all of that can really move our science and our ability to treat these patients even more effectively. Um, there are protective things, you know, so there's some idea that, you know, if you have the biogenetics and then you have the environmental stresses, then you're more likely to have a particular psychopathology. And there are, you know, there are research in looking into what is protective of these people that will maybe prevent, you know, that, es you know, that cascade from um, initiating itself or occurring in any particular individual. So, you know, the point is to get assessed Mm -hmm. you know, to remove the stigma like you've already said mm -hmm. and to understand that this is something that, you know, if it's happening to any one of us, when we get treated, we tend to feel better and we tend to be more functional. We don't lose work days and economically and psychosocially, we're just a more rounded um, individual for getting treated. Excellent. That's a great answer. And thank you very much for sharing that. Can you give us, um, I know that there are multiple symptoms, can you give us some of the symptoms that if someone that's watching the show, that's out in the audience, then they may be thinking, that sounds like me. Can you give us some symptoms of what someone might be experiencing? So at least they have a starting point if they were to make an appointment and see a doctor, they can say, this is what's going on. Do you have any symptoms? So I always like to throw out the common layman term for an anxiety disorder, which is what we call, you ever, ever heard of people saying they have a nervous breakdown? Yes. All right. Yes. So nervous breakdown is, is a common term that most people will say, and what we would describe as a generalized anxiety or a panic disorder or social anxiety disorder. Um, and so it's usually encompasses feeling intense anxiety, intense stress, 
um, some possible physiologic uh, stress, like feeling like your heart's racing real fast, short of breath, feeling like you're almost going to die type feeling, like mm -hmm. something really bad's going to happen, not being able to sleep, not being able to eat, constantly worrying, um, and um, not being able to rest or, or relax. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So I appreciate your 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 delving into that and and helping us to um, demystify this process because we want people to definitely get the proper necessary um, treatment, the necessary assessments. Certainly, we know that you are experts in your field with child and adolescent psychiatry as well as adult psychiatry. And so I certainly thank both of you for coming onto the show. Now, if I needed you to come back, would you come back on the show? What's on your mind with Dr. Des? Of course. <laughs> I certainly do appreciate it. And so we're going to wrap up today with anxiety disorders. And so would you like to give a phone number if people felt like they needed to um, to get in contact with you about services? Yeah, there are several services. Um, available online. I mean, the NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Illness, is a great um, place to start. Southern Illinois Healthcare Foundation has several clinics around the Illinois area. Uh, in Missouri, there's a, a host of um, places, you know, that we can access care through. Um, so I think going online and finding any one of those resources will be a great place to start. And that's a great place to end. And so thank you very much with What's On Your Mind with Dr. Dez. And remember, let this mind be in, be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And we're going to come back with Miss Stephanie Miles on Smiles TV. Wow, what's on your mind with Dr. Dez? Her own broadcast, Dr. Dez, I, I told the others, Dr. and Dr. Lloyd, they need their own broadcast too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for bringing everything together. I think Thank it was a you. great, great broadcast. How do you feel? I feel great, and I feel like the information that was given was amazing. Um, and we will go ahead and provide information. So if someone wanted to contact either one of Dr. Loins, then they can have that information and they can make that phone call. Excellent, excellent. And thank you again for being a part of Smile Television Talk Show. I want to thank you for tuning in. And guess what? We have so many things going on. February 28th in East St. Louis, Illinois, at the East St. Louis City Hall Rotunda, we're going to have a health seminar. And um, it's going to be great. It's going to be talking about natural foods and natural health care and things of that nature. We'll give you more information along the way. Remember, Jesus is the Lord. The Lord be magnified. And only what you do for Christ will last. Keep smiling. You look better when you smile. The Smiles Television Talk Show wants to showcase your business, organization, church, and activities. If you have an interest in being a guest on Smiles Television Talk Show, or if you have any show ideas, contact Stephanie Anthony Miles at smilestv777 at gmail.com. You may also call 618-741-3770. Tell your friends to subscribe to the Smiles YouTube channel. Let Smiles TV increase your reach. Remember, you look better with smiles. Miles TV.